So through his word, God showed, he manifested to men and women who he is. We learn, don't we, that God is a God of purpose. And his purpose, as Brother Matt has shown, is to fill the earth with his glory, his glorious characteristics. And we learn that he wants to do that through people. And these are people who've made a choice in their lives to reverence him and to delight in his ways. Now, part of God's innate character is a desire to reach out that he might be who he will be. And to reach out fully to men and women, God chose to identify with the problem that man and woman had in their human nature. And so the Lord God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his son, the Lord Jesus, would fully manifest to men and women who God is, what he is like. Show his glory, show that character to everybody. And to, to fully manifest God is impossible, again, as Brother Matthew has shown, unless it's lived. And so the Lord Jesus Christ would live. He would manifest God to the uttermost in his life. Come to Isaiah 55. We'll come to John 1 in just a moment, but come to Isaiah 55 to begin with. And as we're turning there, just keep thinking through in your mind the fact that this subject is by definition practical. God manifestation is about living that character of God. But here in Isaiah 55, we're going to pick up some words of the prophet, which we're going to then see through the Gospel of John. Uh, actually, if you looked at your margin in Isaiah 55, you'd see John's Gospel all over it. But we're going to go in at verse 10. <clears throat> For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And the point is being made, isn't it, that God's word will go forth and it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. Now, let's go to John's gospel now, and we're going to see this ever so clearly. And if we don't, well, that's my fault. So the, the point that we can see, first of all, is super obvious. The, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word. It's there, isn't it, in verse 14, we read it. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So immediately we see the importance of the manifestation of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here was the one who would show to us God. Uh, Brother Matt shown, didn't he, that through the word we see God. And here is the word made flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember at the beginning of the chapter describes God as the word. The word is God. It says that in just uh, the first couple of verses of the chapter. And so God's existence is bound up in his purpose to, to fill the earth with his glory. I will be who I will be is the meaning of God's name. What is it that God will be? Well, we've seen, haven't we? He'll be those wonderful characteristics which were shown to us in Exodus 34. And so now we can see that perfectly demonstrated because in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the word, the plan, what God is shown to us. God's very being, his character, his quintessence embodied in his son. The Lord Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. And so we put there some connections to take us back to Exodus 33 and 34. And it's so obvious, they're so easy to see here. Again, you'd see them all over your margin. You've just spent two minutes going through. You see Exodus 33 and 34 coming through. And so we have established very simply, don't we, that the Lord Jesus Christ 
would show us the Father. Here was Emmanuel, God with us. But remember, though, it's practical. The Lord God's desire is to see people live, eventually live forever. But the point is to live, to show it. And so now we're going to see the word that's been made flesh go forth. The Lord Jesus Christ would go forth to accomplish the purpose for which he was sent. So notice now the language in verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth. That's what the Lord had said through the prophet. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So we see there in verse 43, the word, verse 14, is made flesh. The word is now going to go forth, verse 43. Now, as we see the word going forth, the Lord Jesus Christ now going to begin his ministry, we see the first sign that's recorded for us here in, in John's Gospel. And it's in there in chapter 2, and it's that miracle where the Lord Jesus Christ turns the water at the wedding in Cana into wine. And I want you to look at how the Lord describes the purpose of this miracle. Chapter 2 and verse 11. <clears throat> this beginning of his signs, of his miracles, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. So the miracle was done to show his glory. Remember, though, that his glory is the glory of God. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. OK, so when we're showing forth his glory, this is there to show the glory of God. So we ask ourselves the question, how is it that this miracle, and the reason I've not gone through it is I know you know this miracle well, how is it that this miracle showed forth the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of God? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It was a miracle. Of course it showed the glory of God. The Lord Jesus Christ said, the Father dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Of course it showed the glory of God. This is a miracle. Obviously, it showed the glory in that sense. But in a deeper level, we perhaps can grasp how this miracle demonstrates the glory of God. Because it shows, I think, what God manifestation is about. The vessels in the uh, parable, sorry, in the, the miracle, represent the disciples. Now, interestingly, in John chapter 1, if you went through and counted them, you'd come across six disciples, five and John the Baptist, so six altogether. And six, we know, is the number of man, but the stone takes us back to the law, doesn't it? Okay, the, the law was made of stone. So, so clearly these people were steeped in the law. Six people steeped in the law. In fact, John, doesn't he, represents the law and the prophets. And the water represents the word. That's a, an easy one for us. You know, we could find all over passages that show that the water represents the word. But this is the point that I learned this week. And this is why it's good to do the readings with other people. Because people show you things. You think, oh, that's a goodie. It says there in verse 7 that they filled these water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And that word brim is usually translated from above. Okay, now, again, you could follow this through uh, in John's Gospel and see it elsewhere, again, outside John's Gospel, that its usual translation of this word is from above. We filled to the brim. So you normally think to yourself, don't we, the water coming up? But you've got to get this idea. This is being, they're filled to the brim. It's about being filled from above. Now, the reason that I kind of thought, oh, that's a good, that makes a, a lot of sense to me here, is because look what Jesus says to Nicodemus, who is a teacher of the law, in fact, the teacher of the law in Israel. He, he says to Nicodemus in verse 12, 
If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And then look at verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is the, uh, of the earth is earthly, and speak of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what Nicodemus is being taught here, and I recognize that me just leaping in like this is uh, not the easiest, you know, you've got to take some time to look at John 3. But what he's being taught here is that you need to take on heavenly thinking, okay? You've got to get the thinking from above. That's the mindset that you need to have. You need the water from above, as it were. And so when we're back in Cana in chapter 2, and that water is turned into wine, what I think that they're being taught there, as that they're being taught that it's going to go to the brim, it's got to be from above, that those men who were stuck in a law of stone needed heavenly thinking to understand that they need to be born again by taking on the water of the word, to be part of the new covenant. And of course, that's what the wine would symbolize, isn't it? Uh, and, and it's through that that they'd be able to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, we know that the new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ was better than anything that had been before. And so hence you, we see that phrase, don't we, at the end where he says in verse 10, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have dr well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The new covenant is better than anything that has been before. And so that heavenly thinking, that thinking that's got to come from above, is the thinking of the new covenant. And when we think of the new covenant, we recognize that that's the covenant, which we're a part of, which is based on grace and God's forgiveness. And it's mediated, it's been brought to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this whole section has got links all the way back to Isaiah 55. As I mentioned, we're in Isaiah 55. But come back there again, Isaiah 55. And uh, it's too late, apologies, but possibly stick a marker in John, because we'll be back there. And here in Isaiah 55, God says that his ways are higher than our ways. You see that in verse 8 and 9. He says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Verse 8. Verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, why? Why and how are God's ways so much higher than our ways? Well, the answer, I think, or the key is in verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. So God is willing to forgive. That's the basis of the new covenant, the promises. God will reach out and forgive our sins. He is gracious. Now, the thing that I thought was particularly interesting about this is that my mind's obviously in Exodus 34 and in John 1 when thinking about these things. Now, c come back to Exodus 34, because when Moses was up in the mount, they're receiving those tablets of stone, the old covenant, the law, Interestingly, having had this revealed to him, as we've looked at already in Exodus 34, the name of God proclaimed to him, understanding now what the way of God is, what the glory of God is about, what God's name is. Look what Moses picks up on straight away after this. So verse six and seven, we've looked at already, but now look at verse eight. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my people, I pray thee, go among us. So, sorry, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. 
Okay, so he understands that in the end, to be taken for God's inheritance is those people who will actually reveal uh, that character. But isn't it interesting that Moses immediately picks up on the fact that God is a God of grace who will forgive. If I have found grace in your sight, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. And so Moses knew that. Okay, he picks that up. Isaiah 55, that is why God is higher than us, because God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Why? Because the Lord God has got a mindset that is willing to reach out and to forgive. And now that's going to be shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was full of grace and truth. And in every aspect of his life, he showed to us the glory of God. Truly, he could say, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And we see the Father in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see in the miracles of Jesus, there the power of God being shown, that he's able to deal with sin and its consequence of suffering and death. We see in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God over men. We see a better way. The Lord Jesus Christ saying, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to them that persecute you. Now that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is asked of, a much better way. We see in the behavior of the Lord Jesus Christ, the character of the Father, a right way that won't be compromised, but loving, compassionate, and this desire to reach out. And to me, of all the things that I feel like I've learned in doing this study, this is perhaps the most crucial, that we grasp that it's within God, it's part of his being to reach out. God is merciful and gracious. That, that is not the same as us showing mercy or grace. See, for us, we, in showing mercy or grace in some time in our lives, are showing a little glimpse of that character. For God, it's different. For God, it's part of who he is. An integral part of God is mercy and grace. The fact that he is long-suffering, the fact that he is abundant in goodness and truth, that's who he is. That's not the same as us simply showing those characteristics. And so hence, when man sinned in Eden, immediately God is reaching out and he provides a solution, doesn't he? Showing to them there that it will be in his son, the seed of the woman. His solution doesn't compromise his perfection in any way. He is severe with sin. To, to, to be severe is to cut off. And that's exactly what happened in Eden. And so as the Lord Jesus Christ now goes forth, we see him reaching out to others. In a, and in those acts, he's showing to us this is who God is. Come to John 9. Now here the Lord Jesus Christ is going to heal a blind man, a man born blind from his uh, birth. Of course you're born blind from your birth, aren't you? You can't be born blind not from your birth. But anyway, uh, a just note, John. So here we have verse 2 and 3. See what the disciples say. The disciples ask him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, in terms of thinking about God manifestation as one of, if not uh, the great themes of scripture, the answer of the Lord is saying a lot here. Surely the answer that the works of God should be made manifest in him isn't the answer as to why this particular man was born blind, but rather it's the answer 
as to why there is any imperfection in this world. Because in the end, it's the consequence of sin in Eden, isn't it? That's why there is imperfection. But why did God give man over to mortality, over to this state? He did it to teach man that his ways and not our ways are best. Well, when is it then that God did famously work, that the works of God should be made manifest in him? Well, the time when God famously worked was surely in the days of creation, when he worked and then rested on the seventh day. Well, thinking about God working in creation, keep reading now in verse 5. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. You think of creation, don't you? When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. You think of creation. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And so we think of the creation there, for sure. Humanity, under the curse, are born blind. It's our condition. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have our eyes opened that the works of God might be manifest in us. God's creative work made everything very good. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ could do here. He could make things very good. It was man's disobedience that brought about a world of pain and of suffering and of death. And God allowed that to the end that his works could be manifest in us. God wants us to recognise the problem that we have and turn to him and see in him a right way. Come to chapter 11. Here we see the raising of Lazarus. Notice what the Lord says to the disciples. Verse 3, therefore Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, of course, we know that Lazarus does die. In fact, he's been dead for four days when Jesus gets to Bethany. Verse 17, he found that he'd been laying in the grave four days already. Now, although it's not recorded, Jesus very clearly must have had a conversation with Martha and Mary, similar to the one that he had with the disciples, where he's explaining to them that these things have happened, that they might see the glory of God. So having had the stone removed from the grave, just look what he says to Martha in verse 40. Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Now we don't see that conversation. We don't know when it was that Jesus said to Martha, if you believe you'll see the glory of God. But just as he spoke to the disciples in verse 4, he clearly must have had that conversation with Mary and Martha as well. So that now he's able to say, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So how is the glory of God going to be revealed? Well, again, in one sense, you think, well, come on, it's so obvious. His power was shown in the fact that he was able to raise the dead, a dead man in the grave for four days. Is about to come out of that tomb. Just to read it, it's just such a, an incredible thing, isn't it? Verse 41. They took away the stone from the place where the dead was lain, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stood by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. And so we see here 
God's glory, his character revealed. He wants to reach out. He wants to save people from death. From the days of Eden, that is who God is. He wants to reach out. It's his good pleasure to give the kingdom to those who want it. In the promises that were made to Abraham, he said, in your seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, all nations will be blessed. God is interested in all people. He wants to reach out. He wants to give people the kingdom. And so come now to chapter 12. You remember how that, we didn't read it, but you might remember that at the wedding in Cana of Galilee in chapter 2, the Lord said to his mother there, the hour is not yet come when his mother uh, came to him at that, at that wedding. But now we see here in verse 12 that the time has come. Verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Gal Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And so the Lord saw this as the time. The Gentiles were now desiring to know the Lord. That's surely the catalyst for this there in verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among them. And as those Greeks, the Gentiles, are coming and saying, we would see Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ knew that now the time had come. Now all nations <laughs> were interested in wanting to come to him so that he could say, couldn't he, in verse 32, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. He knew that now was the time. All men were coming to him. And the Lord, in recognising that the time had come, he knew that his purpose had been to accomplish God's purpose. Verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. What an amazing situation. The Lord God speaks out in answer to the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ was to say, Father, glorify thy name. God's answer is, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. In other words, I have glorified it through my beloved Son, through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he knows, of course, that he's going to die. But the reassurance is there, I will glorify it again. The resurrection will happen. He knew that through his death, God would bring many sons to glory. This would be the way that he could draw all men to him. And of course, at times, we all wonder, how did he do it? How did the Lord Jesus Christ live this perfect life, showing us the glory of God, manifesting God's name in every aspect? How did he do it, even willing to die on the cross? How? Well, clearly, he had a unique and special relationship with his father. Each morning he listened to his father. He had a sense, a delight, a sense for the fear of the Lord, a sense for the word. He understood, like nobody else, the big picture. You see, his choices were based on the joy that was set before him. He grasped what we too often wrestle with, that God is right. He is truth. 
His ways are best. The Lord Jesus Christ was a vessel full of the word. In, in the Lord's mind, it wasn't about him. It was about God. As the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, he says. Time and again, have I got that on the screen for you? Yeah, those references. You're welcome to have this PowerPoint by all means. But, you know, those references all the way through it, the Lord Jesus Christ saying, it's not about me. It's about God. That's all I'm doing. These works are the works of God. These words I'm speaking, they're the words of God. That's what I'm about. I'm about God. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ grasped better than anybody else. Sadly for us, we have too much of man's teaching in our minds, man's arrogance and self-belief. And that was the problem for the men that were stood here on this day too. Verse 43, or verse 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory of men, it's the same word, more than the glory of God. That's what they loved. The praise, the glory of men, more than the glory of God. And almost in reaction to that, the Lord Jesus Christ cries out, verse 44, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And the Lord is saying, I am all about the Father. And this is God manifestation. In the Father is life. You can have it if you believe it. It's so sad that, that men choose to reject life because they love the glory of men rather than the glory of God. When people hated the teaching of the Lord, look what he said in chapter 15 in verse 23. Chapter 15, verse 23. <clears throat> he that hateth me, hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. They ended up hating the Lord God. Now, what's so funny about this is that the Jews thought they had a wonderful relationship with God. But you see, their problem was that in the end, they wanted it on their terms. The Lord Jesus Christ fully manifested God's terms and they didn't like it. And he did that by simply being the word made flesh. Brothers and sisters, when we have calls to move away from the word and to follow men's current teaching on science or on morality, you can see how dangerous that is. We're showing contempt, even hate, for the Father. We'll get on to that. But we do have to be so careful of this, don't we? God manifestation is about God. It is not about our views, our thoughts. It is about saying, I'm looking to the word the word is where I see the face of God. That is what I'm trying to put into practice in my life. You know, in talking to colleagues at work sometimes about our religion, you know, I get people who say to me, you know, the thing is, 
Like I live life like this any day. Isn't that how God would want me to live? And I haven't kind of quite got the guts, but I want to say to them, have you ever taken five minutes to see how God wants you to live? Because they haven't. They've decided how they think God wants them to live. And do you know the funny thing is, nearly always, and what a great thing this is, it fits in with exactly how they want to live. What a cracker situation where we've got that, where people are just, well, God surely just would want me to, no sort of time to look into, well, what is it that God would want me to do? How is it that God would want me to live, which is there for us in the word? And so we have to be careful that we're not amongst those people. But all too often, you know as well as I do, we allow our minds to be filled with man's teaching. We choose to watch, to listen, to assimilate rubbish. Brother Bob Lloyd once famously said, garbage in, garbage out. And a huge problem with allowing the garbage in is that we become so immune to it that we end up ourselves even questioning what sin is. We want to be the arbitrators of what is right, what is truth. And there's such a strong desire amongst humanity, isn't there, to justify ourselves. In fact, we've got to such a point in our society that we've now decided it's probably easier to just simply say, you're right, and I'm right, and she's right, and he's right. Let's all be right. And so we now actually live in an officially post-truth society. We do in Wales anyway. I was, went to a conference about it, okay? <laughs> but, you know, the, the, a guy that rewrote the Welsh curriculum, okay, Professor Donaldson, he's speaking, he's a nice chap, and he's kind of done all sorts of good stuff for Welsh education. But in this conference, he's speaking to, you know, all these teachers, head teachers, saying to them, we live now in a post-truth society. What? What does that mean? How do you have that? How do you have multiple truths all over the place? It does not make any sense. So everybody's doing that which is right in their own eyes. And the stupidity of the approach is so obvious if you think about it. In, in a natural world, we see laws that govern gravity. It's not debatable. It happens. It's true. Gravity and other such laws, they are essential. If we ignored them, we wouldn't exist. Well, moral truth is also essential in our dealings with one another. When there is no truth, there's no trust. And when there's no trust, society cannot function. You can't have any truth will do. That doesn't work. There is a truth. Now, of course, God is not bound by some higher principle called truth. No. God is truth. Brother David Bailey wrote in uh, an excellent book that I would uh, recommend to anyone, The Power of Forgiveness. God is the only unchanging reality in existence. God is the source of all. Reality exists in him. He is sovereign over all and the sole arbiter of how and why things are and what they should be. Whatever he says is right. His word, his laws, his commandments are truth. Very, very helpful words there. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he believed that. He believed that in God is truth. And he didn't spend time questioning the truth of the word. Like us, no doubt he would have been tempted to, but from a young age, he showed a reverence and a respect for his father. At 12 years of age, the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, I must be about my father's business. You know that from Luke 2, verse 49. Now, some people's version might say, I must be about my father's house. Other people's version might say something else. But, you know, there's no word there for business, for house or for anything else. What he's saying is, I must be about my father. That's what I'm about. That's who I am. I am about my father. Now turn to John 14. Remember that here we're in the upper room. There is a 12-year-old child. I am about my father. And now we come to John 14. And here at the age of 33, at the end of his ministry, he says here in verse 10, Believest not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. 
The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth his work, the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. And what I thought was interesting is that they're exactly the same Greek words. I am about the Father and the Father about me. The Father was everything to the Son. The Lord Jesus would not compromise his Father. That's what he was about. And so when we come to John chapter 17 now, and we're now just hours before his death, we see him pray. <clears throat> These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. And I'm going to read from the revised version now. Having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The prophet had said, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The Lord explains the work that he'd had to do. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. And he repeats it again in verse 26. I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. This is God manifestation. The Lord Jesus Christ showed it perfectly, full of grace and truth. And his sacrifice then that he was willing to go through with declared God's justice, his righteousness. He showed the world, the Lord Jesus Christ did, that God's judgment was right. Sin needs to die. And of course, he hadn't personally sinned, but he was tempted in all points as we are. His nature, like ours, was prone to sin. He was mortal like us. And so he was willing to give his life. The ultimate declaration that God was right. Sin does need to die. Any propensity to deviate from God manifestation is better dead. And so there on the cross, the Lord Jesus showed the fullness of God's character, abundant in goodness and truth. God wouldn't allow sin to continue, but his love is so deep that he would give his only son he would give of his blood, it's described in Acts. God personally became involved in the plight of humanity. He gave his beloved son. He was willing to relate to the problem, to reach out, to identify himself with us. And we see God's character, don't we, manifest there. All the way through the Old Testament, in writing, and of course, we see it in deed, we see the character of the Lord God being shown to us, but never has it been shown so vividly in a single act than in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. From God, we see mercy and grace, goodness and truth. And from the Lord Jesus Christ, we see a man perfectly mirroring that image. As the Lord himself hung there on the cross, there he was reaching out, to others, reaching to the thief, then to his mother, Mary. In every aspect of his life, the Lord Jesus Christ manifested the Father. He was truly the Word made flesh. 
And so, like the centurion that stood at the foot of the cross, may we say with conviction, truly this man was the Son of God.